Hello, and welcome to another Health Essentials Podcast. I'm John Horton, your host. Three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, has served as our classic eating schedule for hundreds of years. The times, however, are changing, and the times when people sit down to eat seem to be changing with it. So now the big question, is that a good thing? Today we're going to chat about how the timing of meals and snacks can affect your weight and daily energy levels. Joining us is registered dietitian Julia Zumpano, our go-to source when it comes to food and nutrition. She is one of the many experts at Cleveland Clinic who visit our weekly podcast to offer insights into healthier living. Now let's see what we can do about setting up an eating schedule that keeps us both happy and healthy. Julia, thanks so much for coming in to talk shop today. Thank you so much for having me. So eating is one of those things that, that we all have to do every day, uh, but fitting meals into increasingly hectic schedules uh, just seems to be getting harder for everyone. Uh, am I imagining the degree of difficulty going up when it comes to sitting down at the kitchen table? No, I certainly uh, agree with you. I think our schedules are becoming overly packed and, you know, after school activities or after work activities are really taking over the dinner, the dinner hour or, you know, span of time where you can get dinner in at a reasonable time. Um, and it's leaving us as, you know, Americans scrambling for what to eat and what we can grab on uh, quickly and on the go. And I think is leading to some disordered eating patterns in general. Well, we're going to try to get things all straightened out here today, which is, which is why we asked you to come join us. So uh, let's start with this whole notion of eating, you know, three square meals a day. Uh, where did that come from? And is it effective when it comes to fueling our bodies? So uh, the three meals a day actually originated um, back during the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century where there was normalize a normalization of work hours. So really it started with, you know, a pre-work meal, a, you know, kind of a, a mid-work shift snack or like lighter meal. And then of course, when you get home from a hard day at work, you have dinner. So I, that's where it originated, you know, back before then, um, most, you know, most of the time, you know, we're eating one meal a day. So it was, it was really has evolved into, three meals. And, you know, in, in some cases now, six. Well, I was going to say it is, it is still evolving. And, and um, mm -hmm. I guess in, in looking at that traditional schedule, um, you know, let, let's talk kind of optimal eating times. Um, and, and since breakfast is the, is the first meal and, and often called the most important, uh, let's start there. So, you know, the way I approach nutrition may be a little bit different than, you know, most traditional dietitians. I really like to look at personalized approaches. So I don't know if there's a specific best eating time for everyone to follow. I think everyone might need to follow what their best eating time is. For instance, I think, you know, sometimes intermittent fasting or restricting the time you eat works great for some people. You know, if you're on um, certain medications or you're a diabetic or you have suffer from low blood sugars, then you really do need to eat a little bit more regularly. regularly. Um, so, you know, generally, if you are a breakfast eater and this is something you enjoy, I recommend eating breakfast within the first hour to hour and a half when you wake up. And I really do encourage more of a protein-based breakfast. So bro protein and fiber trying to limit or avoid sugars because sugars can certainly lead to spike blood sugar values, which then can lead to plummeting blood sugar values and leaving your blood sugar low and kind of searching for more sugar. And again, energy it drops your energy level. So when you're talking proteins, I take it you're talking kind of like the, the eggs and, and, and maybe uh, sausages or some meats, something like that to kind of get you going at the start of the day. Yeah, I'm a fan of eggs, egg whites, you know, depending on how many eggs you're consuming throughout the week. Um, a turkey sausage or chicken sausage is great. I love uh, like a simple cottage cheese or Greek yogurt for breakfast. I think they're great sources. I also like even some scrambled tofu for breakfast. There's a lot of great choices. A protein shake or a protein smoothie is another quick 
easy breakfast on the go. I do encourage fiber with that. So if you're going to have eggs, maybe throwing some greens in there. If you're going to have cottage cheese or Greek yogurt, having some berries and nuts with it. If you're going to have a smoothie, making sure there's protein and then um, fiber in the form of like a fruit or vegetable, maybe even some flax seeds or chia seeds. So there's a lot of, of range of possibilities. All right. Well, everything you just said should keep us filled up um, till lunch, <laughs> which I know usually falls around noon. Um, are there any secrets uh, involving the timing of, of lunch or, or how much we should be putting in that lunch sack? So generally, I like to space meals between four to six hours apart. Same type of theme with as we had for breakfast is keeping protein and fiber really present in the meals and specifically for lunch, because most times we uh, can experience kind of this drop in energy around two or three. And that generally comes again about two hours after your main meal. And if your meal consume is, is too high in carbohydrates or maybe even too high in fat, that can leave you feeling pretty sluggish. So we want to try to keep your meals a little bit lighter, more um, more heavy in protein and fiber, and, and really focusing on the foundation of what's in the meal um, versus, you know, being overly con- concerned about the timing. Well, you mentioned that kind of that, that downturn that we all feel like around two, three o'clock. And, and that that does seem to be the prime snacking time, too. Um, what What's the best approach for when you want to have that nibble um, in between meals? So um, I, I do I do think snacking can be fit into a day, although I really you know caution with snacking because oftentimes snacking leads to high amounts of snack foods and and consuming quick, easy foods, which tend to be snacky foods or processed foods. If you are going to snack, I really encourage a whole food like a piece of fruit, some vegetables, some nuts, something pretty light. Um, But I also do um, try to encourage my patients to consider and really think about if they're really hungry. So are we snacking out of hungry hunger? Are we snacking out of boredom? Are we because we're low energy or we want a distraction from work or what we're doing? So if you prepare your meals um, in, in the right, you know, macronutrient content and really filling them with protein and fiber, like I said, you should be able to last between four to six hours between meals where you may not need a snack. Now, that doesn't mean snacking is bad for you, but I would really keep in mind your hunger cues. Are you truly hungry? And if you truly are hungry, your stomach's rumbling, you know, you, you maybe had a light, too light of a meal for lunch or breakfast, then I, I do encourage a snack and, and a whole food-based snack. But uh, snacking can get us into trouble oftentimes if we're not mindful of our decisions. Well, that, that's definitely true. And I, and I know that from, from personal experience, <laughs> I, I tend to be a little bit of a, of a snack monster in the middle of the, the afternoon. Um, but let's say I, I, I did the lunch thing right, and it's carried me all the way through to, to dinner. Um, that seems to be a meal where, where people are, are all over the place as far as when they sit down to eat. Um, what are the pros and cons of, of an early or, or a late dinner? So an earlier dinner, you know, I'm more of a fan of because it gives you, you know, a good amount of time to digest your food after dinner and um, allows your blood sugar to properly rise and fall after dinner. So you're not going to bed with a full belly or this, you know, skyrocketed blood sugar. So I'm, I'm really a fan of, you know, earlier dinners or at least, you know, three hours before bedtime is, is my ideal recommendation. You know, if, if a later dinner is something you have to do and you kind of just life gets busy, I, I don't think you should be overly concerned with it. I think you should just make better choices um, and, and try, even if that's part of your lifestyle, to make dinner maybe a lighter meal and your smaller meal. And if you know that you're just consistently going to eat later dinners, then maybe making your lunch a little more of a heavier meal and your larger meal that can kind of carry you over through dinner so you're not over consuming calories, especially if there's a big span of time between lunch and dinner, 
or at least you're having a nice, good, substantial snack in between if you're going, again, greater than six hours between meals. So, you know, I'm, I'm like I said, I think that you can make any time work. It's all about your choices and your portions. Okay. If you do go with that later dinner, I know you'd mentioned a three hours in between kind of dinner and, and bedtime to try to set it that way. If you eat a little bit later, are, are there some things you can do to kind of maybe help speed up digestion a little bit or, or kind of, you know, help that process along? Yes, yeah, certainly moving around is going to help. So if you're eating dinner and going straight and laying down in bed, even if you're bed for two hours, um, that's going to certainly slow down the digestion process. So if you can take a short walk, maybe a 20 minute walk, or you can even just stay, stay standing, maybe you organize a closet or clean the kitchen or whatever you can do to kind of keep your body upright and any moderate amount of movement is going to really help um, with digestion and burning your blood sugar. Um, and then, you know, just kind of helping you digest that food better too. Well, our, our focus here has been on that traditional kind of three meal eating pattern. Um, but as you mentioned earlier, there are, there are numerous approaches that, that people take. And I know one of the more interesting ones that seems to be gaining in popularity is, is time restricted eating. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm a fan of time restricted eating. I think for the proper individual, it can work really well. Time restricted eating is when you choose to restrict your eating into a, a shortened time window. It can range anywhere between eight to 12 hours of an eating window. Therefore, you would be fasting between 12 to 16 hours. And typically that fast occurs overnight. Um, the benefits there, there, there's been a lot of proven health benefits, you know, gut health, um, decreasing insulin, increasing um, concentration, increasing kind of memory and alertness, um, helps with digestion. So it, it, there have been a lot of, of, lot of benefits for those people who really can gain benefits. I mean, certain, it's not right for everyone, but it, I think it's worth a try. Now, in that, uh, when, when you do that time-restricted eating, do you still just try to set meals up? I mean, I, I have two college-age sons, and to be honest, I think they could actually eat for eight hours straight. So I just want to make sure they don't go that road. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the person and, and what you know window you're choosing. Certainly, a 10 or 12-hour fasting window would place this into a normal eating habit, you know, kind of starting breakfast at at um, 8 a.m. and like kind of cutting off around 6 p.m. would be a, a normal, you know, 10 hour eating window. Um, if you're shortening a little bit tighter, like an eight hour, um, you may choose to have two meals and more of like a, a, a substantial heavier snack in between. Uh, for those who might be eating a later dinner, this could be maybe work well for you if you're having like a, a later breakfast a mid-afternoon substantial snack, and then kind of your later typical dinner. Um, or you could switch it around. You know, I think there it just allows for a lot of opportunity and flexibility. Yeah, you can add a little variety into the day. And it sounds like just kind of eat within that window and, and, and make it work. I think the key is really what you eat. So making sure you're choosing healthy healthy food choices, whether it's a meal or a snack. Wonderful answer there. So, um, all right. So now, Julia, now we're going to do something a little different. Um, ahead of this podcast, we asked folks on Cleveland Clinic's social media channels if they had diet-related questions, um, and, and they certainly did. So uh, let's let's get uh, let's get them a few answers. So one of our social media followers said they heard that it's better to to skip dinner entirely um, and just wait to eat again until breakfast. Um, is there any sort of truth to that sort of concept? Yeah, so that kind of comes back to the concept we were just discussing with the time-restricted eating. You know, I, I do think that some people do benefit from eating heavier in the morning and then, you know, basing your eight-hour window from breakfast, counting eight hours and having your last meal maybe be later in the afternoon and then skipping dinner. I think that can work very well for some people, um, specifically those who may suffer from, you know, sleep disruption or, you know, digestive issues or even elevated blood sugar, elevated insulin. I think that type of eating, you know, schedule can really work for some people. All right. Well, now someone on Instagram asked uh, kind of the age old question uh, to snack or not to snack, because um, they said once they start snacking, uh, it 
just turns into a lot of eating. Um, what kind of tips do you have to kind of slow that down? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm not a huge fan of snacking unless you're truly hungry. I really like to focus on what your meals are because a, a lot of times I, you know, take a look at the meal. Um, what's really, what are you eating? Are you eating, are you consuming enough protein? Are you consuming enough fiber? Because typically you're not, and that's what's leading you to needing to snack or overeat later in the afternoon. So if we really start the day off and, and focus on protein and fiber with all of our meals, we should feel so full that we don't need to snack. If we're eating more processed, junky foods, snacky foods for our meals, you know, starting off with a pastry, eating a peanut butter and jelly for lunch, you know, we're, we're certainly going to be left still hungry. And that's going to be throwing off our blood sugars all over the place. And that's going to lead us to be craving those carbohydrates or fatty foods. Once, you know, a lot of snack foods are designed to be overeaten. They are made that way. So once we start, well, are going to have trouble stopping. So it really comes down to the foundation of what you're eating at meal times. Well, and I know you had mentioned too when it comes to to snacking, people do tend to grab that you know really processed foods, kind of the the junk food that's usually sitting around. I take it if if you are somebody who who tends to get that little, uh, you know, you want to nibble in the middle of the afternoon, um, you should probably then try to have just some good healthy food around. Yeah, absolutely. I actually recommend veggie trays a lot with my busy patients, um, even like in the office, buying a veggie tray to have all week. And at that two, three o'clock drop in energy, boredom, you know, desire to snack time, you can just kind of go grab some raw veggies. A lot of people crave like that crunchiness, something that they can get their hands and mouth involved um, in eating. So, you know, liquids don't necessarily cut it, but like an apple with some peanut butter, you know, some veggies, something really whole food based, high fiber, um, adding some protein to that, like a boiled egg or some turkey, some nuts. That might be a, another great idea. All right. And, and finally, another one of our fans wants to know if, if there's one meal in particular uh, that should always be your largest of the day. Well, I, I'm a fan of having a larger lunch. You know, we know some European countries really kind of focus on that larger lunch and, um, you know, maybe a lighter dinner. And, um, we know, you know, t European countries tend to have a lower incidence of disease and obesity when compared to Americans. So I really do like kind of that middle day larger meal. Um, unless you're willing to eat an earlier dinner, then I also think, you know, you know, as the American culture, we do tend to have bigger dinners. If you'd like to plan family dinners, I'm a huge fan of eating with other people. I think it helps naturally control portions. It helps slow you down. It helps enjoy, you know, bring pleasure to meals. Um, and then, you know, you can share. So I think there's a lot of great benefits to family meals. So if you are going to have that larger meal at dinner, even trying to plan it earlier. So I think we kind of get in the trap of like, well, we can't eat dinner at four. Well, why not? You know, I mean, kids get off the bus, they're starving. You know, you might get off at five, but there's nothing wrong with eating right after um, right after work, because then you have your whole night free and you don't have to necessarily be trying to fit it in. You know, Julia, what really struck me throughout this conversation is, is that there, there's no just one right answer. It sounds like you can kind of tailor your, your meal plan to kind of your own, your own needs, your own body, but you just try to make healthy choices as you're doing it. John, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly my message. It really should be tailored, personalized. Number one thing you want to keep in mind is what you're eating, are you consuming enough protein and fiber at your meals? And are you snacking on whole foods? And the timing really can vary based on the individual and their schedule. Well, Julia, I'm pretty sure we could talk eating habits all day. And I love, every time I talk with you, I leave with, with, with great information that, that I know I use in my life. Uh, but I know you've got appointments you need to get to. Uh, so before we kind of part ways, is there anything else you'd like to add regarding when we choose to eat and what we eat? I think it's important to experiment. So I think we talked a lot about different methods and different times of eating. And I think it's important to experiment with what time works best for you. Try out time-restricted eating. If that doesn't work for you, go back to traditional. 
But like I said, really what you're eating matters way more than the time that you're eating it. Oh, great answers as always, Julia. I uh, love having you on and uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Eating at consistent times throughout the day is important to keep you fueled up and ready to go. Find a schedule that works for you and stick with it. Your body will thank you. Till next time, be well.